Welcome to Conversations the World Over. I'm Raymond Arroyo. Tonight's guest is an accomplished politician and philanthropist who works tirelessly on behalf of needy children as president of the Save the Children Action Network. I sat down with him a few years ago to discuss his heartfelt memoir about his father, Sergeant Schreiber. It was entitled, A Good Man, Rediscovering My Father, Sergeant Schreiber. Here is my conversation with Mark Schreiber. People are so familiar with the accomplishments of your father. Uh, he's the man who founded the Peace Corps. He led uh, Johnson's War on Poverty. Yes. Uh, so many accomplishments, the ambassador to France uh, and, and the husband of Eunice Schreiber, which is no small accomplishment. Yes. Um, <laughs> you, in this book, sort of unpacked the essence of this man. And when he passed away, so many people came up to you and said he was a good man. What did that mean? What did you discover behind that accolade? Well, you're right. A lot of folks claimed when he was alive that he was a great man for having created the Peace Corps, Head Start, Legal Services for the Poor, Job Corps, uh, Foster Grandparents, Vista. Uh, but what they said to me after he died was that he was a good man, including the two women who used to serve him lunch, who waited in the line at the wake and said your dad was a good man and then turned around and walked out of the church. The guy from the U.S. Air Terminal who said the exact same thing. Um, so I wanted to dig in and try to figure out what it meant to be good as compared to great. Uh, and when the lights are on and the cameras are on, and particularly in Washington, D.C., there are a lot of great people that aren't good. Mm -hmm. But dad was the same, whether it was talking to Cardinal Wuerl or President Clinton or President Reagan or the waitresses at the uh, restaurant. He treated them all the same. And I wanted to understand how he did that and did it so well and so joyfully. Yeah, there was this boundless joy about him. Absolutely. I mean, he was, he was a buoyant, happy fellow. And, um, and you discovered the source of that happiness, that optimism, and real affection. And we'll get into his fathering later, because I think so many of us struggle with, you know, how do you maintain your career and you're supposed to accomplish all these things, and yet there are these little lives that we're, we're, we're in charge of for a small period of time, and how do you balance that? What was the source of that joy and the animating spirit behind this man? Well, I think, you know, I, I tried to distill it down and it came back to faith. I think it was the fact that he went to mass every day of his life. I think he was raised in a family that believed in the gospel's call for social justice to feed the hungry, clothe the naked. Uh, his father, or excuse me, his godfather was James Gibbons of Baltimore, the second U.S. Cardinal. His grandfather had gone into the seminary and dropped out twice because he was sick both times. Became great friends with James Gibbons, and that was my dad's godfather. And I think that faith was tested in the Depression and in World War II, but I think it came out of those experiences even stronger. And I think that, that faith called for acts of hope and, and love, which is what I think his life was built on, faith, hope, and love. You accompanied him many times to Mass. You, you, went to, you would go to daily Mass with him, and then, of course, on Sunday. Um, what was that like, and did he ever offer any counsel about, because let's face it, it's tough to get up at the crack of dawn and, uh, yes. and, and meet this obligation, decide yes. I'm gonna go to Mass every day. That, that's a tough uh, a ritual, and, and yet he, he and maintained he, it. He did it every day. It didn't matter whether he was on the road in this country or abroad, wherever we checked into a hotel, the first question he'd ask is, what's the Mass schedule? Uh, so he wanted to go the next day. It was part of his routine, and it made him, I think, when he got down on his knees and asked for help, he realized he wasn't God. Uh, and he realized that God was in charge and that he needed God's help. And I think one of the things he did tell me uh, is that before he went to daily Mass, he'd spend 10 or 15 minutes getting ready for it. So it was a process of getting ready to go to Mass, then getting on your knees and understanding that you weren't God and asking for that help and support. Mm. And I think it, it fired him up. He came out of Mass every day excited for the day. Uh, and whether the day was just enjoying nature or whether it was enjoying the person in front of him. And that person could be a cab driver, the guy from the gas station, a grandchild, or a cardinal or a president of the United States. But he treated them all the same because he thought that they were really sent from God. Yeah. He really believed that. And I think he believed that God is either everywhere or God's nowhere. Hmm. And he believed God was everywhere. And that made him excited, but also paradoxically slowed him down so that he could appreciate the moment. Yeah. No, he was, he was a man who, um, obviously, you need a certain amount of ego to run for public office and to be in the public arena. But that said, he didn't crave it. He didn't, he didn't crave the affection of, 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 of the masses and wish to be the center of attention all the time. No, definitely not. And I think the book is really a process of a uh, son trying to figure out how his father lived that life, mm -hmm. how he wasn't uh, really a slave to his ambition and ego. He really thought in more of a cosmic frame, if you will. Mm -hmm. He wanted to be a good son of God. Uh, it's uh, a beautifully it's, written book, and there's a portion here where you say, Dad was good because he was great in the smaller, 
unseen corners of life. Explain that. So that means that when you're on a TV set or you're a politician or you're a wealthy businessman, uh, it's easy, I think, easier to be great because everybody's, uh, you know, telling you wonderful things right. about yourself. When the lights go off and no one's paying attention, when you're at the gas station, when you're at the grocery store, are you the same to those people as you are to the big shots? Mm -hmm. And Dad was. He was consistent uh, across the board. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that was because he saw everyone as a gift from God. And for this son, trying to figure that out so I can work with my wife of 20 years as we raise our three children, uh, as we try to balance faith and family and friends and commitment to job, I needed to figure that out to do a better job as a father, as a husband, and as a friend. I want to talk about his career and, and his parenting, but first I need to talk about your mother, Una Schreiber, who is such a hero, uh, the founder of the Special Olympics, uh, really had this burning heart for people with disabilities throughout her life. Uh, you write, it's a funny story, about the when, when your father's the ambassador in France. Yes. Tell us about that. And you mean, was when that? my mother took the, oh, yeah. when they're training them. Yeah, in the, bringing in the people into the, yes. into the, the embassy. <laughs> Tell us about that. There are a couple of stories there. What, yeah, and, and how, that, how, how that happened. So mother believed that people with developmental disabilities ought to have access to the American embassy, just like the big shots in Paris or the big shots from all around the world did. Mm -hmm. So she brought in people with developmental disabilities, and they would train in the embassy or in the backyard, and they would roll in tires and do athletic drills in the American embassy in the late 60s in Paris, of all places. So she didn't believe in, you know, uh, isolating people. Right. And she wanted to bring people together, people with developmental disabilities, and expose them to all the things that other people had. And she knocked down the walls of misunderstanding and prejudice. you got to remember, in the late 60s, most people with developmental disabilities were locked in institutions, right. and forgotten and isolated. Shut it away. And she, did, she knocked those walls down, and Dad supported her, because I think that's what love demanded. Yeah. And you got to remember, at that point in time, it's uh, even a more uh, male-oriented society than we have today, yeah. where the man is supposed to be out front taking all the credit. Mm -hmm. uh, and Dad let Mother do that. Uh, I don't know whether he let her. I mean, Maria, my sister, said in her eulogy, of mom that uh, dad let her rip and roar. I don't know whether he let her rip or roar or whether she was going to rip and roar on her own. <laughs> but it worked. It was a great partnership. Yeah, and I think, again, they, you know, mother went to mass every day of her life. Mm -hmm. So I think it's that common, you know, they had desire. That they, they had the, that common faith. And yes. that, in the hard times, that sustains you. Sustains you in the happy times and in the, in the tough times. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what pulled them through 56 years of marriage. Yeah, and one of the things I took from the book, the great, the joy of this man. I mean, he's out playing on the lawn with you guys. Uh, tell that great story from the 60s where your brother Timmy falls so, and your uncle Bob Kennedy is yes. there, Bobby Kennedy. Yes. Tell that story. Well, the only addition is, is that was my brother Bobby. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. That's okay. They're both Bobby. older brothers, no problem. Uh, and Bobby fell. Uh, I was about four or five at the time, so Bobby was about 13, 40. He started to cry. And Bobby, Uncle Bobby Kennedy said, you can't cry. Kennedys don't cry. And Daddy scooped up Bobby and said, don't worry about it. You can cry. You're a Shriver. And I think the story was that he was comfortable with emotions. You know, he was comfortable with the fact uh, that you could cry. That was normal. He was comfortable with unconditional love. When my brother Bobby screwed up and got arrested for smoking pot, and it was all over the front page of the paper, yeah. um, Dad brought him into his room and looked him in the eye and said, look, you're a good kid. I love you. This is going to work out fine. Don't listen to what anybody else says. And I think, you know, when Dad was considering running for governor or maybe even president and the family was on the front page of the paper, yeah. he just offered his kid unconditional love and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And the same thing happened to me when I backed out of the Peace Corps. The very entity he created, um, yeah. you know, I backed out. And he just said, well, how can I be helpful to you? How can I help you with your career? Huh. And, you know, when a son feels that or a daughter feels that unconditional love, yeah. there's really nothing you can't do because you know your father is behind you because mm -hmm. he loves you regardless of what you're going to do. Yeah, well, he told your brother after that spectacular, you know, all the coverage of this, and it was possession of, you know, marijuana, but, but the coverage was intense and it yes. was front page story. And he tells him, don't worry come here, I'll take care of you. Right. It'll be fine. Yeah. But there was a great line he put in the public release about well, he'll make manly restitution. Yes. And, you did. know, Bobby, when he eulogized him, used the word, this is how he had always seen manliness. And I thought it was really interesting. Uh, I noticed the juxta those two words in there mm -hmm. uh, juxtaposed against each other. Mm -hmm. And I think Dad saw manliness as the ability to love and to forgive your kid, mm -hmm. uh, not to yell at your child, uh, to support your wife in whatever she wants to do. And for a lot of men in this country, that's a different vision of what manliness is. You know, we've got to be the alpha male. We've right. got to yell at our kids and dominate mm -hmm. our family. And Dad didn't see it that way. Mm -hmm. And I think he was happily married for 56 years, got five kids who love him. And for me, raising three kids with my wife, I wanted to learn that 
uh, to see how it would be a different type of man, uh, one that was full of love and, and unconditionally. So. Let's talk for a moment about, you were there when he dropped out of the 1976 presidential run. It was at the National Press Club. Yes. And you took a lesson from that moment. What was it? Tell us about it. Well, we got in the car and went on the airplane. Uh, and the Secret Service men came over and made Dad sign some paperwork. And then they walked off the airplane. Uh, and the doors close. Mm -hmm. And it's over. They're gone. When you land, you're getting your own cab. You're picking up your own bags. You don't have Secret Service protection. And what I took away from that was that when push comes to shove in politics, you know, there are a lot of people that tell you great things about you. But as soon as you lose, you're done. You're out. You're out. And what's really important is your faith, your relationship with your friends and your family, uh, and the work you're trying to do. But all the adulation and the people telling you how wonderful you are uh, really is gone the day you're out. And I don't think that affected Dad because I don't think he really ever listened to that. Yeah, you said he had a spiritual confidence about yeah. him, even in the midst of you know letting go of, of his, dr his big dream, really. I think so. Uh, yeah. I don't know whether that was his big dream. I think he wanted to do it because I think he saw at that moment that that was an opportunity to try to make the country a better place. Mm -hmm. I think the next day after the election's over, uh, honestly, he just never complained and, and moaned about the loss. Yeah. He was ready to do something uh, new, and that could uh, be anything for him. You know, whatever opportunity came forward, he was ready to pursue it. Tell me about this notion of peace that he had, that one could go out and be a creator of peace. Um, I, I'm involved with a, with a, a little boy's cause, Matty Stepanek, and his cause for sainthood, which is just starting, and he considered himself a peace advocate. Yes. There's some of that that I see in your father. He, you know, he not only thought we could be creators of peace, he created this core of people. What was the intention and where did that come from? How is that related to his Catholic faith? Well, I think he saw uh, his experiences in college when he went in an experiment for international living and saw how much he learned by being exposed to different cultures and coming back to go to college and to beyond that about what he could bring back to America. And I think he thought that if he did that and it gave that opportunity to other young Americans and people of all ages, really, in America, that they would not only help the countries they were serving, uh, but just as importantly, they'd come back and make America more diverse, more understanding, mm -hmm. a richer place to live. And I think he, that's proven out. I think he'd be disappointed that there's only uh, 9,000 Peace Corps volunteers. He'd be very proud that Teddy Shriver, my nephew, is serving in Peru right now. Oh, really? Uh, yes. But I think he'd want more because I think he saw it was a way to express America's best values, that we were willing to serve. And as he said in a speech at the mall here in Washington on the 25th anniversary, serve, 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 for in the end it'll be the servants who save us all. Mm. So I think that idea of serv serving uh, whether you are a Peace Corps volunteer or a VISTA volunteer or a Special Olympics volunteer. Was at the center of his life. Yeah, definitely. And that that was giving of yourself. He, he said this at a class, uh, he gave it a speech at the Yale. I was just about to mention the speech. Yeah, tell, to break tell the mirrors. Uh, you know, and I think he, he challenged the Yale graduates to break their mirrors, mm -hmm. to stop looking at themselves as, uh, as much as they were and start looking at their neighbors. Uh, look at the people with developmental disabilities, the poor person who may live uh, outside your neighborhood. Uh, and I think that was really his, his call, was to break your mirrors and start looking at others to build those bridges of understanding and acceptance in a, uh, in, instead of focusing on your bank account and your annuities. Mm -hmm. Tell me about his many gifts as a father. And we're talking about your father, Sergeant Shriver. Um, he was a great note writer. Tell us about this and the impact it had on you as, as a child. He wrote notes uh, when I was in high school and slipped them under the door almost every day. Um, you know, what, what he did had they read. say? What would they It be was everything about? from a, a box score and a baseball game to the dinner conversation. When I got a little older, there were notes were accompanying a book by Gary Wills or Elie Wiesel or Cardinal Lustige. I mean, you know, Henry Nouwen. They were every type of book. Uh, and he'd mark the margins about the great parts that he thought were really relevant. And he'd encourage you to read the book. It may be a, somebody he bumped into on the street. Uh, but what he was doing was showing love and interest in his kids. And he was challenging you intellectually, trying to push you spiritually uh, by slipping these notes or mailing one or two a day uh, after I'd been uh, married. My wife, you know, we'd, our, mailing, our mail went down a lot after dad got sick with Alzheimer's uh. because we didn't get those two letters every day. And, you know, sometimes it'd be two, three a day. Wow. Just, kind, you know, updates on what the family was doing, some thoughts he had. Uh, and they weren't text or emails. They were handwritten notes. Handwritten notes. On legal paper. 
And I put one in the back of the book, the note he wrote me yeah. when I graduated from high school, which mm -hmm. was very powerful, I found when I was, went back and researched the book. Yeah, you want to share it with people? It's a beautiful letter. Sure, it just says, uh, happy graduation day, Mark, and congratulations. I always remember that you are a unique, infinitely valuable person. Your mother and I love you. So do your brothers and sisters and friends. But all of our love and interest put together cannot compare with the passion and interest and love God himself showers on you. You are his. He wants you and he will make you the perfect man you want to be. Love, Daddy. Mm -hmm. And what struck me about that was, you know, you'd think that on a graduation day you'd tell your kid to work hard in college right. and his dreams would come true, mm -hmm. that America was the land of opportunity. And what he wrote was, God loves you. Yeah. And your brothers and your sisters and your mother and I love you. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think he felt, which is true, that if you, have, if you know you're loved, you can do anything. Mm -hmm. And that's the message he wanted to get over to an 18-year-old kid, and it's reassuring to a 48-year-old man. Too. There's a great line in the book that I, that I love. You, you, you wrote, I grew up with faith, hope, and love as explicit topics in my household and with my father, who embodied and lived by those three tenants. In what way does he still represent those three tenants for you? I think in the notes that he wrote, uh, in the lessons he taught my kids, you know, my dad suffered from Alzheimer's the last 10 years of his life, and our oldest is 14. We have a boy, a girl who's 14, Molly, his son, Tommy's 12, and Emma, who's 7. So they know my dad. They didn't know him really well. Uh, but I remember when he turned 93, he was cleaning off his, you know, he took the last scoop full of cake, and he had Alzheimer's and a little problem with his knees. And Tommy was, at that point, 9 or 10. And dad got up took his plate and walked into the kitchen and started, you know, cleaning his dish. Mm. And my son looked at me, took a last fork full of uh, ice cream and took his plate and went into the kitchen too. And he was learning from his grandfather at 93 that regardless of how old you are or how infirm you are, you can help. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the message he, my kids got. They also got a sense of his joyfulness. He would play catch with them even a couple of weeks before he died and he'd start to throw it to one and give him a head fake and throw to the other one, and he'd laugh. Wow. So they know that he had a joyful side to him, uh, but that you also had to help out around the house and be a good man. This, this long 10-year battle with Alzheimer's, I know must have been wrenching for you to be a part of. Um, you ask him at one point, there were, uh, as people, I don't know, those who aren't familiar with Alzheimer's, it, it is a terrible disease, but it comes and goes. There are moments of lucidity, and then yes. they don't remember how to tie their tie or, or, or their shoelaces. Um, you ask your father at one point, and you're driving along, or I think you're driving, and you ask, yes. uh, you're losing your mind, Dad. How are you doing with that? And what does he say? He says, I'm doing the best I can with what God has given me. Mm -hmm. And I reflected back on that, and I think that that's the way he lived his life. Whether he was given the chance to survive the Depression after his family lost all their money, uh, whether it was surviving World War II, whether it was you know, arranging the Kennedy funeral, which Jackie Kennedy asked him to do yeah. on a Friday afternoon for Monday, and he had to organize not only the mass, but all these foreign dignitaries uh, and all of that work. I think he always did the best he could with what God had given him. Uh, and he realized in joyful times and in sad times to keep pushing ahead. And he realized he wasn't God. Uh, and he realized that these were gifts from God. And that's what I think you know, made him so joyful every day mm -hmm. and so driven to try to make a difference. He realized he, he was trying to do God's will. He married into this, this political dynasty in so many ways. Did they thwart his political career, do you think? There are a lot of, there's a lot of speculation that they did. The answer is dad never complained once about it to me. And uh, what is as, your I wrote, gut, as I wrote in the book, In Vino Veritas, you know, he had a couple of drinks with my friends, he had a couple of drinks with the family around, and he never complained. He never said, you know, I got shortchanged by the family. He loved my mom, got along with his brother-in-laws and his sister-in-laws. Uh, I think was grateful for the opportunity that God had given him. But just as he said, you know, I'm doing the best I can with what God's given me, mm -hmm. he got the chance to start the Peace Corps. He got the chance to work with Vice President Johnson to create the Peace Corps and then to run the war on poverty. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, you know, he never complained. Uh, so I'm not going to complain for him. Mm -hmm. He uh, was joyful for, you know, his, his marriage of 56 years. He dated my mom for seven years. So he clearly married the woman of his dreams. No, he had and, an incredible uh, life. And he, he did the best he could with what God has given him. So I don't know. I mean, you can read it in the history books that his career was thwarted, but that's spilt milk as far as I'm mm -hmm. concerned, and he never complained about mm -hmm. it, so I'm not going to. I want to talk about the last lesson your father gave you, and it was when you were arranging his funeral. Yes. And he asked to be buried in a Trappist sack. Trappist burlap sack, yes. But 
we don't allow that in the United States, so you had to make some accommodations. <laughs> yes, so uh, I researched and found that the Trappists were making uh, coffins in Iowa, I believe. Oh. And so I called the guy up and went through uh, what they offered, mm -hmm. and I ended up buying the plainest one they have. Mm -hmm. And it's just a, uh, I think it's a pine box, yeah. just simply a pine box. And I often thought, you know, as I was sitting there uh, getting ready for the, for the mass, people would think we were cheap. Uh, and then I realized that really his life was trying to keep it simple and to focus on what was important. When you went into his rooms, there were pictures of his mother and father, of Cardinal Gibbons, of St. Thomas More, uh, you know, St. Joan, um, uh, uh, St. Joan of Lustiger, I believe, mm -hmm. quotes on the wall, uh, and, you know, crucifix and rosary beads. And that was it. You know, no pictures of him with famous people, huh. uh, none of the pictures of him with presidents or cardinals. Kept it simple. And that's what he wanted in death. And he taught me that, you know, what was really important was your faith. And it's not to be buried in a fancy box or to have all these fancy pictures. It's to do what was right, and that's to have a relationship with God. And I think that's what really, as I said, gave him all of his energy. What is the lasting lesson that you wish the rest of the world to know and to take with them, particularly fathers? Um, I think what his life really was about was that commitment to faith mm -hmm. and that he made that a number one priority and that his kids felt that and his, clearly his wife did and he married a woman who believed the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you have that foundation, you can really do anything. And I mm -hmm. think that his faith demanded including everybody. It demanded including Jews and Protestants and Catholics and Muslims. It demanded the atheists all to try to do, as he said, our father's business capital O, capital F, and he said that as a public sector person in 1966. And I think our father's business is to help the poor, uh, to feed the, the uh, hungry and to clothe the naked, and that's what he called. So I guess the one message is I hope people, maybe they write their kids a couple more notes, yeah. slip them under the door so it shows that you are caring yeah, about your children. The, that's one of the little tricks I, I said, you yeah. know, I have to start doing that. It's a great, Because they see that you personal. care about it. Yeah. Right. It's not an email or a text in mm -hmm. some hieroglyphic language. It's a really that you sat down and took it out, uh, your mm -hmm. pen out and wrote your kid a note. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, you know, the faith thing is clearly uh, the, the most important part of his life. A Good Man Rediscovering My Father, Sergeant Schreiber, is available at bookstores everywhere and online. Let me know what you thought of tonight's show and which of our interviews you'd like to see on an upcoming edition of Conversations the World Over. You can always write me at Raymond at RaymondArroyo.com. Sign up for my free e-blast. I'll send you a link to the show online each week. The new show premieres each Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time in the U.S. For those of you outside the United States, Go to EWTN.com for your air times. Next week, my classic interview with Hollywood legend Ricardo Montalban. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, I'm Raymond Arroyo. The conversations continue. You don't want to miss them. Bye now.